Hello, my name is Scott Sturgill and I'm a Nutrient Management Specialist with the UW-Madison and UW-Extension's Nutrient Pest Management Program. And I have the next topic in the CCA pretest training webinar series and that topic is soil phosphorus and soil phosphorus management. Phosphorus is one of the big three uh, plant elements. Uh, when you buy a fertilizer bag there's three numbers stamped on it and those three numbers are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Phosphorus is critical in the plant. It's uh, important in photosynthesis, seed production, and other plant uh, functions. Soils inherently contain large amounts of phosphorus. Unfortunately, most of that soil phosphorus is fixed, meaning it's strongly bound to soil particles and unavailable to plants. <clears throat> and when we add supplemental phosphorus fertilizer in plant available forms, such as manure, commercial fertilizer, etc., that phosphorus is quickly converted or quickly fixed, immobilized, whatever term you want to use, to the soil and unavailable for uh, plants to utilize. This is an example of the phosphorus cycle. All our nutrients have cycles and this is just a representation of um, <clears throat> what phosphorus looks like and is doing in the soil. Um, phosphorus can enter the uh, phosphorus cycle or the soil through uh, in the organic farm form excuse me through plant residues manure biosolids uh, it can also enter in an inorganic or plant available form uh, through commercial fertilizer um, we also get a minuscule amount of phosphorus from atmospheric depositions such as rainfall and other things once phosphorus gets into the soil profile, it's quickly partitioned into one of two pools. Uh, these would be the fixed soil phosphorus, which is largely in an unavailable form, and that phosphorus which is dissolved and contained in the phosphorus solution. This is the plant available form. This is the form of phosphorus <coughs> excuse me, that the plants will utilize uh, for uptake. And we'll talk more about uh, what those percentages are in the soil profile between available and, and uh, unavailable soil phosphorus in a moment. Uh, other components of this phosphorus cycle, we talked about the inputs. Uh, removals of phosphorus from the cycle come from corn har or crop harvest excuse me, and removal. Um, runoff losses of phosphorus, which we hope to minimize to minimize environmental impacts, spe specifically those impacts on surface water quality. And under the right soil conditions, we actually can leach a small amount of phosphorus. Phosphorus, as I mentioned, is typically strongly held by the soil and the soil particles. <clears throat> but in situations where we have phosphorus-saturated soils or we have sandy soils, you know, with a lot of water moving through them, we can actually leach some of the phosphorus through the soil profile. But usually those are relatively small amounts. So we talked about, <clears throat> in the previous slide, the forms and concentrations of uh, phosphorus in the soils. The total phosphorus content uh, in soils is relatively high. However, only a small fraction, you can see a couple up order of magnitudes less of that, is potentially available to plants during the growing season. We measure and gauge this available amount of soil test phosphorus through soil testing. Uh, and uh, you can see categories typically 20 to 50 parts per million of soil test phosphorus is where we want to be for, for crop production. Of that, only a small fraction is in the dissolved soil solution phase that's available for plants for uptake. And you can see these, these values are orders of magnitude less than the soil test or available phosphorus as well. So the take home point is there's a lot of phosphorus in the soil, but only a small fraction of that is available to crops to utilize. Uh, how do we measure the availability of the soil to uh, supply phosphorus to crops we grow on it? We measure this through routine soil testing. Uh, test, the soil testing estimates the amount of phosphorus that's available to plants. Um, in Wisconsin, we use a Bray-1 extractant in our soil testing labs for estimating the amount of phosphorus that can come into solution and be available to crops. Uh, other states, you might have heard the term uh, Olson or Malik. Uh, in terms of extractants. Those are used typically in our uh, more western or western midwestern states uh, where they're dealing with higher pH soils uh, and those may be better extractants. In Wisconsin we use a Bray-1 extractant for estimating available phosphorus. We measure our concentration of phosphorus 
in soil and our soil test results in parts per million phosphorus. Remember, fertilizer recommendations and fertilizer grades are given as P2O5, phosphorus in the oxide form, but soil test phosphorus is measured in parts per million of phosphorus. Various forms of phosphorus fertilizer are available. Uh, you can see here a listing of the fertilizer types along with the chemical formula, the analysis, and the solubili solubility, or how readily that phosphorus product dissolves and is available to plants to utilize it. Rock phosphate, as you see, is the, this is very, uh, has a very low solubility, and rock phosphate is the source of our phosphorus fertilizers. Uh, rock phosphate, apatite mineral, is mined in Florida, western uh, United States, and in Canada. Uh, this product is treated, it's ground up, treated with uh, various acids and in some type cases mixed with other fertilize, fertilizers to form the uh, fertilizer products we're all familiar with. Uh, rock phosphate is tri transformed into superphosphate, triple super, superphosphate, and uh, probably more commonly in our agricultural use in Wisconsin, the products of either DAP or MAP. DAP is diammonium phosphate, MAP is monoammonium phosphate. You can see the solubilities, the availability of these fertilizer products is much greater than the raw phosphorus material we, we mine. Phosphorus deficiency, rarely are you going to see this in Wisconsin crop production. Uh, as we'll look at in a moment, our average soil test values across the state of Wisconsin for phosphorus are on the high to excessively high range or, or even higher depending on the crop's uh, demand level. So we rarely see phosphorus deficiency uh, in our plants. Uh, phosphorus is a mobile nutrient in plants, so if we were to see phosphorus deficiency, those phosphorus deficiency symptoms are going to show up on the older leaves or in corn, the bottom leaf, um, leaves in the plant. Uh, a mobile nutrient, uh, if it gets scarce in a plant, means the plant will translocate it, feed off the old plant, and put all the energy and the mobile nutrients into the new growth. Uh, phosphorus is a mobile nutrient, therefore the nutrient will go to the new growth, the deficiency symptoms will show up in the older leaves. The characteristics of phosphorus de deficiency in corn are a purpling of the leaves. Here you see the older, the bottom leaves, in this case the whole plant looks purple. There have been cases where phosphorus deficiency uh, doesn't truly exist There's, uh, and is mistaken for, for other factors. Uh, a lot of the, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but a few of the corn hybrids that we're aware of exhibit this purpling of the plant in the seedling stage uh, regardless of whether deficient or not. Uh, the, it's a characteristic of the, of the hybrid or the trait. Uh, also, in situations, if we have a delayed cold or slow start to the growing season, uh, plants may exhibit these deficiency symptoms in the seedling stage simply because the roots haven't developed enough to get out into the, into the soil and utilize the nutrients that are there, or in corn, the roots just haven't made it to the starter band yet to utilize the N, P, and K that's in that starter band. So if you see purple corn in the seedling stage, it one may be a, a hybrid trait. Um, or two, it may be um, short-term phosphorus deficiency even though our soil levels are adequate and as soon as that plant uh, warms up and uh, expands its root mass, that phosphorus deficiency will go away. So again, phosphorus deficiency, rare in Wisconsin, you're likely not going to see it. I have never seen phosphorus deficiency in alfalfa, but uh, doing a literature research or an internet search, we found some photographs showing phosphorus deficiency and the symptoms there would be a stunted, uh, again, somewhat purple or red stained plant, uh, smaller than an adequately fertilized phosphorus uh, alfalfa plant, but I haven't seen it. Uh, whether you will or not, I, I would doubt, but I just threw up some slides showing phosphorus deficiency in alfalfa. One of our main concerns with phosphorus management is its potential for impact on water quality, specific surface water quality. Uh, in freshwater ecosystems, phosphorus is the most limiting nutrient uh, in the aquatic ecosystem, meaning if we add phosphorus, that's the nutrient that the aquatic weeds and algae are going to respond to uh, first because it's most limiting um, in the water body. Uh, additions of phosphorus accelerate eutrophication, the aging of, of lakes and streams, 
They, again, promote algae and weed growth, and that can have an impact on the aesthetics and the tourism and the recreational value of our water bodies. Um, in some cases, they can result in toxic algae blooms. We've read this past summer and the last couple, couple, couple summers of various lakes across the state of Wisconsin where we're seeing blooms of toxic blue-green algae that can have an impact on animal and potentially even human health. Uh, a more traditional concern about phosphorus is when all this uh, accelerated growth of weeds and algae dies and decomposes, it utilizes the dissolved oxygen content and draws that down in lakes and streams, or more, more so in lakes than streams, and can result in fish kilts from the uh, dissolved oxygen content depletion. So we want to keep phosphorus out of our lakes and streams as much as possible, and we'll talk about management practices in a moment for how we do that. This diagram illustrates how phosphorus can move from a landscape, be it a, a woods, an agricultural landscape, or an urban landscape, and get into a water body. Uh, it rains, the water that doesn't infiltrate into the soil profile um, can run off the landscape. When it runs off, it has the potential to, to erode soil and carry soil particles uh, that are enriched with phosphorus. If we're moving enrich topsoil from agricultural fields, chances are we're pretty good that we're moving nutrients, including phosphorus, off that landscape. We're also moving phosphorus not only in the particulate form with the soil particles, but in the soluble form. Uh, dissolved phosphorus can be carried by that runoff and into lakes and streams. And uh, from a water quality standpoint, it's this dissolved or soluble phosphorus that we're primarily concerned about. Soluble phosphorus, dissolved phosphorus, has a potential for immediate impact on the water body in terms of promoting weeds uh, and algae growth in a water body. So when we're looking at parameters, um, environmental parameters, uh, a lot of focus is on this soluble phosphorus that's being moved off the landscape. However, that isn't the only thing we need to be concerned about because even though this particulate or sediment bound uh, phosphorus is coming into the water body off the landscape. Particulate P will dissolve and release soluble phosphorus over time into the into the water body. Um, so the uh, limnologists and uh, people who study hydrology and water quality have numerous terms that they're using to um, evaluate or, or talk about the impact of phosphorus on a water body. Soluble phosphorus is one we've talked about. Particulate phosphorus, we've talked about that's the phosphorus that's contained or associated with soil particles. Probably a more important parameter to measure is bioavailable phosphorus. And from a water quality standpoint, that is all the soluble phosphorus, the, the phosphorus that can become available and spur weed and algae production as well as an estimate in this bioavailable parameter of the amount of particulate phosphorus, uh, the amount of soluble P that can be released from particulate phosphorus. So bioavailable measures the soluble P and then uses a technique such as a chemical extraction or usually a bioassay to estimate how much of the soluble phosphorus is going to be released from this particulate phosphorus that enters the water body and can become available to um, weeds and algae in this water body over time. Lately, EPA has looked more so at a easier parameter to measure than this bioavailable parameter in terms of measuring the impacts on water quality, and that's total phosphorus. Total phosphorus is the sum of soluble phosphorus plus particulate phosphorus. Now that's probably higher, usually higher, than the amount of phosphorus that's reactive and available in a water body but it's an easily measured parameter. So again, total phosphorus you'll see in the water quality literature typically, and that includes the soluble P plus the particulate P. And if I could bore you with one other topic about terminology and phosphorus, um, it's important when you're looking at uh, research studies or literature, looking at runoff and soil loss and its impact on water quality, and specifically phosphorus loading, to know about the terms of, about concentration and load. Concentration is the amount of phosphorus that's dissolved in a unit of water or runoff. That's the concentration of phosphorus per you know liter uh, or parts per million or what have you. Um, load 
is a more important uh, parameter when measuring the impact of management practices on water quality. Load is that concentration of phosphorus in a unit of runoff or water body multiplied by the volume of runoff that comes off that field. So for example, you may have a low concentration um, of phosphorus in runoff multiplied by a high volume of runoff, the impact would be relatively low. If we had a high volume of runoff with a high concentration of phosphorus in that runoff, the water impact, quality impact could be very high. So you want to look at, in terms of impact on water quality, be aware of the terms phosphorus concentration, which is the density of the phosphorus per unit of water, and the phosphorus load which is the actual amount of phosphorus that's getting off the landscape, carried by the runoff, and into the water body. There's various studies that compare the impact of management practices on losses of phosphorus, and um, it means different things, whether we're talking concentration versus load. From an agricultural standpoint, a landscape, scan, landscape excuse me, standpoint, we want to be focusing on agricultural load versus, uh, excuse me, phosphorus loading as opposed to phosphorus concentration. When we get on the farm, uh, phosphorus is dynamic. This diagram here teams, looks at uh, on-farm phosphorus cycling. We have inputs, use of phosphorus on the farm, and outputs of phosphorus uh, leaving the farm. Inputs of farm could be to the farm could be fertilizer, uh, nutrient uh, inputs, dietary uh, inputs for our livestock, feed as well. Once it gets on the farm, it's utilized on the farm, and significant amounts of phosphorus are exported from the farm in terms of crops that are leaving the farm, milk that's leaving the farm, meat that's leaving the farm. Typically, though, as we try to illustrate here, we're not removing all the phosphorus that we're bringing onto the farm. And the excess phosphorus on livestock operations anyway, particularly dairy operations, is usually applied to the cropland fields uh, through the manure. The unutilized phosphorus in, in livestock situations is bypassed through the, through the animal into the manure. The manure is applied on the soil. And over time, if we're applying more phosphorus, including fertilizer phosphorus and manure phosphorus, then our crops are removing we can build up soil test p-values over time. It takes time to build up these soil test p-values. It's not a bad thing to build up soil test p-values. As a matter of fact, it's a good thing. Again, the soil has a high affinity for phosphorus and can hold that, hold that phosphorus, and we can utilize it as a fertilizer resource. However, you, the potential for detrimental impact if we have any erosion our runoff from these fields is going to be greater if we're dealing with fields that are excessively high in soil test phosphorus than those fields which are optimum or low or lower for phosphorus. So we example of phosphorus cycling on the farm, inputs, outputs, and its impact on soil test values over, over time. Whoops, wrong way. This is an example uh, or an illustration showing the impact of uh, applying more phosphorus than crop removal or animal removal on farms over time. This is looking at our average soil test phosphorus levels from our cropland fields in Wisconsin uh, over a f nearly a 50-year period in the state of Wisconsin. These are averages from our University of Wisconsin, well actually from all our Wisconsin soil testing labs. Every five years the UW labs will collect uh, samples or summarize soil test samples for phosphorus and potassium over the previous five years and look at what trends are in the state of Wisconsin. This green bar is the non-responsive range for our typical field crops in Wisconsin. These are the soil test phosphorus levels that are in the high to excessively high value. You can see over time uh, from when we looked at it and in, started looking at them in the in the mid 60s we've built up soil test phosphorus slowly but steadily over time to where, to where the average uh, soil test level for phosphorus in the state of Wisconsin is significantly higher than crop needs. Something encouraging about this diagram is you see the last time we looked, 2005 to 2009, the statewide average for soil test P is declining. That's a good sign and I'm very curious to see where this next five-year summary, which should be out 
really soon is going to be whether this decline trend is is going to continue or whether we're back to building up soil test phosphorus. But I'd like to uh, attribute this to uh, the explosion in uh, nutrient management planning on farms over time. Folks such as you, CCAs and others, uh, getting a, a firmer grip on, on manure management, on overall fertility management on farms through nutrient management plans. And I also think there's probably an economics component. You know, the explosion of fertilizer prices that we saw in uh, 2007, 2008, 2009 probably caused producers and their crop consultants to look a lot closer at, at fertilizer inputs and maybe to utilize manure more efficient, efficiently across the farm. Uh, so this downward trend uh, is a good thing and I hope we continue to see it in the, in the future sampling periods. And with that I'll conclude with part one of, of uh, phosphorus and phosphorus management. Uh, please join me for part two. Thank you.